All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Mike Primazic. Uh, we're at his home in McMinnville. It's June 14th, 2021. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Certainly. Uh, first question, the biggest question to get us started is why wine? Oh, wow. Well, it was really a, it was a lark. It was a lucky lark. Um, I was involved with a woman who was several years my senior, and she was already interested in wine, and she was teaching me how to appreciate wine. And she was also a really good cook, and uh, I was loving it. And I got a job in asphalt, and I was gone all the time. You can't pave the same road every day, so... I was really sick of camping out there and not getting to eat this good food and drink this good wine. And her mother also worked at a winery and said, hey, listen, the winery where I work, they need an extra guy this year. It'll be less money, but you'll probably like it and you'll be here all, all the time. You know, you'll get to be home. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, cool. Okay, I'll try it. So I went up there and I walked around at Erath, and this is in 1999. And I went and walked around the place with Rob Stewart and he has a winery here in town still called Big Fire, or R. Stewart & Co. And uh, walked around the winery with them, and I saw these people operating forklifts with the full mast, going around corners with a load on, full mast. I thought, oh God, that's dangerous. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> I had just come off a job where I was around industrial stuff, and I didn't like it. And we'll get into that in a minute. But I pointed out, Rob, I'd love to work here. I just don't want to operate the forklift. He said, sure, no problem. Well, the reason I didn't want to operate the forklift is because I had just come off of a job working in asphalt. And previous to that job, I had done a lot of time going around to festivals at the country fair and the World Hemp Expo extravaganza. All of these really, you know, fun time festivals and I had partaken in a lot of LSD and mushrooms and so starting this very industrial big time these are union guys job I was convinced I was I was actually I started going into an LSD flashback and this was uncontrollable but I don't know if you realize but you have a heightened sense of awareness and paranoia and I was convinced these guys, they didn't like the way I looked. I looked like a hippie to them, you know, and, and they let me know that in several ways. But um, I was convinced they wanted to off me. They wanted to kill me. And so I was like, oh, my God, I'm out here imagining all these industrial accidents where I could just pfft, no problem. And so I was just really unsettled by this, you know. And so I was driving a truck, a flatbed truck that was 36,000 pounds. It was huge. It was really long. I was driving it to and from Detroit Lake. And it had 10 speeds, but you had to switch gears in between. It's called a transaxle or a split shift truck. I didn't know how to drive that. And I let them know, hey, look, I don't know how to drive this thing. They said, well, there's a huge parking lot where it's parked. Figure it out, but it's a long way to McMinnville, so you have plenty of miles to figure it out in between here and there. So I'm freaking out. I'm driving this huge truck, and so I'm going back and forth, and I did. I figured out how to drive it. Great, no problem. Okay, now I'm cruising, and it had really good handling, this huge thing, because the tires are about as tall as you are. So this thing really cruised down the road. So now I'm, I'm getting the groove. I'm cruising, having a good time with it, but I end up going to one of the locations where I had to pick up parts in Salem, and I was in the wrong location, and it was the parking lot for the Salem City of Salem Public Works. And in leaving that parking lot, I ended up clipping one of the trucks for the City of Salem Par Public Works and lifted it up off the ground, tore the taillight out of it, and I said, oh no, oh no, I'm not licensed to be driving this truck, I'm going to be in real trouble now, I got to go. So I just left. I ran off without saying anything. So I get back to the site where we're doing work and it's just eating at me. And I finally go to the foreman. I say, listen, Jason, I gotta tell you something that's just killing me. I hit one of the city of Salem Public Works trucks when I was in Salem today and I didn't tell anybody, I just ran off. He was like, oh, dude, what do you think we're gonna kill you? And I was like, oh, I couldn't tell him yes. <laughs> so it was, it was interesting. So, um, he says, all right, well, you got to call them, let them know. So I call City of Salem and they set up a meeting with myself and the state police. I got to go back there and have a meeting with them. And so they really threw me up against the wall in that meeting. It, it didn't look like it was going to be a, a fun day for me until they told me, look, we're not going to charge you with anything, but we need you to sit out here at the break table 
because all of the employees at this yard have been pointing fingers at each other and they'd like to see who's responsible for the discord around here. <laughs> so I got to sit there at the break table with eyes of fire. For I knew it was about 15, 20 minutes. They took, I think they got an extended break that day. <laughs> so I got to take the heat from the employees, and uh, that was the extent of my punishment there. I didn't have any actual charges, but the company wanted to keep me there. They wanted me to stay, and I just, I did not want to stay doing that work. It was, it was, you know, I was gone all the time. So the contrast between that work and that level of stress and working with grapes and people who were cool, really cool. It was a no-brainer. I was like, okay, this is a career. This is a career. This isn't a job. This is definitely, I'm staying here. I'm never leaving. This place is great because these people were great, including Rob. Mm -hmm. um, and there was another guy working there. His name is Tyson Crowley. He's still in the wine industry as well. He was my cellar master. He was the cellar master at the time, and so he was training me. 100% he was training me and it was just terrific. He would stop me on the forklift and say, hey, hey, come here, check this out. Come next to the speaker. Listen, this drum fill coming up and he would start teaching me about music because he's a drummer. So he'd start teaching me how to listen to music and appreciate music, you know? And so the contrast, it was just absolutely no brainer. It was, it was people who cared and were having a good time at work as opposed to people who were telling me to stop working and slow down and stand there on your rake. It was it was wild. It was it was such a great great contrast. So based on that industrial accident that I just described, I didn't want to drive the forklift and cause any more damage. <laughs> and so the first night I show up to work with Rob, he says, "All right, well, first thing I need you to do is get on the forklift and move these cases from this warehouse to that warehouse." I was like, "No, really? Oh no! Okay, here we go." So he got on the forklift with me. He sat on the forklift with me and went from warehouse to warehouse with stacks of two pallets full of empty glass all the way down a row, stack them, go all the way back, all the way back out of the row, go back and get some more pallets, stack them. He said, I need all of the pallets out of this warehouse in that warehouse. And I need it to happen as soon as possible because I need to use this warehouse. I said, all right, here we go. So he spends about 45 minutes with me, you know, teaching me how to drive the forklift. And I feel like after we've done this, I have a good grasp. Well, I'm coming up to the corner uh, with two pallets stacked on this forklift full of glass and I see another forklift about to back in front of me. So I just slammed on the brakes oh, and no. sailed it. So there goes the top pallet is just smashed and the bottom pallet hasn't really broken or anything. It's just kind of fallen over and kind of crumpled from the weight of the first pallet falling. Anyway, I'm thinking, oh no, here we go. I mean. I, like I said, I'm maybe 45 minutes, an hour into the job, and here I've done this huge damage. I'm like, this is why I didn't want to drive the forklift. <laughs> so I go find Rob. I'm, I'm just like, Rob, I got to show you. And he comes out, and he's not mad. In fact, it, it's almost like a giggle to him. He's like, oh, don't worry about it. Anything that touched the ground's got to go. Anything that didn't touch the ground, any cases that didn't break open, get them back on a pallet, get it in there, and keep moving these pallets. I need this warehouse. <gasps> Oh wow, I thought, he, not only am I not fired, he wants me to still drive the forklift. Okay, wow, this guy's cool. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I keep going and I go slow. You know, I'm like, all right, I'm not doing that anymore. So I go slow and eventually I get my confidence back and I start giving more gas. And so I'm like, yeah, when I don't have a load on, I'll give it more gas because I want this task to be over. I want to go on to the next thing because I don't like it, it's stressful. And so, I am coming out of the warehouse after dropping off pallets and give it the gas and all of a sudden forklift stops and my hands are on the horn and everybody who's on the crush deck, these are all the international interns, they are all people who are skilled and seasoned, they know what's up, they are all standing there holding their mouth laughing and pointing, oh, I have just exited the warehouse, well tried, with the mast all the way up so I caught the door jam with the mass of the forklift and just completely pulled the wall out like <laughs> away from the foundation. I mean, just caused structural damage. I mean, just awful. And this is only 45 minutes after the first thing. So I'm like, oh no, oh no, I gotta go get Rob. So I go into Rob's office. I say, Rob, you gotta come back out here. He says, really again? <laughs> I said, yeah, but you gotta bring your chair this time. I mean, he goes, oh boy. All right, let's go take a look. 
So we go out there and he says, oh yeah, wow, you really did one. He says, don't worry about it. I'm gonna just get that forklift and I'm gonna back into the wall and we'll shove it back onto the foundation enough that we can close the door during harvest and we'll fix it after harvest. He's like, don't worry about it, but keep getting these. <laughs> so he gets on the forklift. He says, hold the door right here. And he just, I mean, this forklift has 8,000 pound counterweight on it. It's, if you back it into something, it'll move. So he just got on the forklift and burnt, jammed that thing back into the wall and set that wall back up on the foundation in one hit, nailed it. And he says, all right, keep going. I said, wow, this guy's so cool. <laughs> not just understanding, but he's cool. He's like, you know, he, he's not just like smart, but he also can do it. You know what I mean? He's, he's not just a, uh, textbook guy. He's a hands-on, this guy's cool. So anyway, I'm like, first night on the job, I'm impressed with this guy. And I'm like, hey, that guy, he's understanding. I can't believe he still wants me on the job. All right, <laughs> you know? So, hey, I showed up again the next day. I said, all right, I can do it. And, and now I can drive the forklift because I know he's not gonna care if I mess anything up. So, hey, I'll, reckless abandon. <laughs> I quickly earned the nickname Crash Primo. <laughs> Uh, anyway, Tyson Crowley, his, uh, his whole focus from school was production management. And so the way that he would train us at the winery was to definitely, and I'm going to give you a term from Tyson, crash the critical path. And this meant setting things up that were going to take a long time, set those up first because those can still be getting accomplished while you're doing the other small things. And so we just, we were, we had to be efficient. We had a pretty small place for 40,000 case production. And so we had to be really efficient. And uh, he was, he was just that. And he was so much fun to work with because he had a balance of knowing how to have fun and when to have fun and when to put your game face on. And he knew when to say it, hey, today we gotta have game face. And so we had a lot of fun working there and we got a lot done. But there was a guy that I uh, worked with at ERAF that I grew up skateboarding with and that I told him when he didn't want his job at Safeway anymore, I told him, hey, come up here and talk to Tyson, get a job here. So he outlasted both Tyson and I at ERAF and he is now the winemaker at Shea and his name's Dana. And I told Dana, hey, look, when we were working there in the courtyard, I said, look, the guys that we're working with now and the way that this dynamic works for us here at, at ERAF, we need to savor it now because we're never going to have <clears throat> a dynamic like this again. And, and we really, we never have had a dynamic like that again because of Rob, really. He, he let us be production guys without ever having to worry about any of the other overhead mm -hmm. concepts. Mm -hmm. And so we were really able to form a style of wine. And this was Rob's style of wine was to be um, not interventionist. Uh, he he said all, all the work is really happening out in the vineyard. And he said, our job is just really not to screw it up. And he didn't even use such an eloquent term. But he said, you know, in the introduction to this job, your job is going to be a glorified dishwasher. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have really big dishes that you need to keep clean. And the other things that we're gonna teach you along the way are gonna be very useful. But if you start from that, perspective, you're just gonna love this place. And he was right, he really was. So our job was to take good grapes and not mess them up. Mm -hmm. And that approach has definitely come through in the winemaking that I like as far as drinking wine style. I like to drink wines that are light and elegant and expressive. And those are the wines that we would make here in this area based on the ripening climate. Mm -hmm. And so that guidance early on kind of it, it directed what I wanted to do from there and what I wanted to do from there was work at smaller and smaller wineries plain and simple because that was a lot of wine to deal with there was so much wine that you couldn't focus on or just so many barrels to top or so many people that you had to employ I just wanted to focus you know I wanted to work at a smaller place and in 2000 who decided to move on from there and learn how to cook. It, 
it was really interesting. I approached a guy who we, we would drink down here on Third Street, and he had a restaurant. And I said, listen, if you'll teach me how to cook, I'll come and work in your kitchen for free. And he said, oh, wow, that's incredible. He said, that's the only way I could have you in there, because I'm going to close in three months. I said, oh, wow, OK, well, hey, I'll be there every day. Come on, let's go. And so I went in, and, and I uh, took a job maintaining uh, yards during the day so that I could work there for free at night and still pay rent. And uh, I went in there and noticed immediately that he had all of his servers doing everything that he was supposed to be doing on the kitchen side. And he was doing nothing. And so I immediately made sure that the first thing, none of the servers had to touch any dishes. I didn't think they should be putting on an apron to cover their nice clothes. They just shouldn't be doing the dishes. That's obviously not their job. And so it was the first thing I did was made sure they didn't touch any more dishes. And they noticed it and appreciated it more than he did. I don't think he really noticed at first. But after a couple of weeks, he started to notice them tipping me out at the end of the night. And he was not experiencing tips. So he was like, oh, oh, that's crazy. So after a couple of weeks, he said, hey, listen, tonight, you, you don't do any dishes or anything. You don't. You don't do any of that other stuff for the servers. You just, you do my job and I'll do the other stuff for the servers. So the things that he was having them do was obviously bread and water. That's, that's, that's servers. Okay. Then salads, then desserts, then drinks. And so then we're starting to get into appetizers. So they're doing a lot of his job, you know? And so it started to get to where he didn't want me doing any of those things anymore. He wanted me to do his job and then he would cover those things. And it was a really good formative experience because he was a retired uh, culinary instructor. And so he really did know how to teach how to cook. And I had a great time working there. But about three months into that job, I got a phone call and it was from Nick's down the street, Italian restaurant that's still there. And the call said, look, Bill has just quit, their sous chef. If you get down here right now, you could probably get the job. <laughs> I said, all right, I'll be down, I'm coming. So I talked to Tony, the chef I was working for. He said, of course, yeah, go get it. You know. And so I knew the guy, the sous chef who'd quit, and I called him. I said, Bill, what's going on? He, he said, oh, you know, Chris, that guy, I'm, I'm not gonna work with him anymore. And I said, well, listen, they called me, they want me to come down there and take your job. He says, oh, listen, before you go down there, come over here and get my chef coat. I'm never going back there. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right, with his blessing, with Tony's blessing, I went down there and I took the job. And it was really cool because there was a magic at that restaurant. Yeah. And it was a magic that was just barely still left over from the 70s. And it was just, like I say, just barely still left over. I mean, it was cool. The employees who worked there were definitely like a family and the food that they were making was so whole. It was just really a very, very cool place to work. And I was very lucky to be a part of it. And after a couple of months there, the chef really wanted Sunday nights off. So I got to write the menu on Sunday nights and it was just incredible to have people give that kind of credence to a dish that you've created without knowing that you really were at the very baby steps level of learning how to cook. But you know, you got to try things and have people give it a more honest shake than they would if they'd come over to your house for dinner. And uh, <laughs> while, I was able to, while I was able to make nice food, um, it was really formative to, to have that kind of stage to put it on. But back to, um, the Erath days a little bit. Um, during those days, it was wild. Um, we got to have a lot of fun. And what I mean by a lot of fun is probably drink too much while we're working and listen to loud music and water fights all night. Uh, one, one instance in particular, we were supposed to have a truck full of picking totes, empty picking totes ready for a pick early in the morning. And at some point, at in the middle of the night shift, we had gotten into a water fight. The weather was really nice and, uh, you know, we're all running around in boots and underwear and a couple people in vests. And at about 5.30 a.m., 6 a.m., Maya was supposed to show up and pick up this truck. He showed up to a bunch of half-naked people drunk spraying each other with hoses and the truck was not loaded and he 
was really cool about it. He, he thought that was funny. He had a good grin. He came out there and helped me load it up, showed me a couple of knots, how to tie a different couple of knots. He was really good about it. And we got him loaded up and on his way. But this was the kind of stuff that I just don't think you're going to find happening anymore because I think, you know, we just kind of got away with it, you know, just in that last little bit. And so that was 2001. And I know subsequent to that, there was a policy of no drinking and no music at e <laughs> during production. You guys ruined it for everybody. <laughs> we got carried away. Uh, and so <clears throat> since then, uh, I've, I've worked at wineries where we had fewer people to, to encourage such a, such a fight, you know, such a water fight or such other activities. Um, in 2003, uh, I went over to um, Carlton Winemaker Studio for a harvest position. And I didn't know that they were looking for somebody to be the cellar master there, but they were. Well, the person who was running the place, his name is Eric Homaker, he actually hired two people for prospective cellar master position and had one of us work the day and one of us work the night shift. And so during that time, I met a guy there named Jim Marsh. And he was 18 at the time. And I think I was 23. And he was working his first job in wine for Lynn Penner Ash. And he was an intern. And he quickly found out that I was the guy to come ask if he needed something like figure out how to tighten a hose or where do I get this chemical addition or what is a punch down or where do I find dry ice anything that he needed to do the job that he'd been asked to do he quickly knew I was the guy he could ask and count on to find those things or I need a key for this where mm -hmm. do I find a key so we started becoming friends based on this relationship. He thought I looked really cool because I had long hair and rode a motorcycle to work every day. And so he automatically wanted to be friends with me. I, I know this from his account. And uh, I didn't want the young guy to get me in trouble because I like to enjoy myself. And so he was always trying to talk to me about weed. And I said, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> and um, so eventually he invited me to some, and this is a couple of years later, he invited me to some blind tastings where everybody shows up with a brown bag and we all sit there and taste the same wine together and talk about the attributes of that wine using our sensory perception. And I thought, that sounds great, I'm in. And so the first one I showed up was at the lake in Lake Oswego and I show up to the location and there's girls in bikinis heading into this place where I think I'm heading. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is really great. I can't believe it. You know, I'm just, wine, this is going to be so much fun. So I get in there. There is a couple of turntables set up with a crossfader. There's somebody who's spinning records. There's somebody who's got a um, volcano vaporizing weed. And it's a tasting, a wine tasting. I'm just like, this is this heaven. We're on the lake. I, I, I made it. This is great, you know? So by the time we're done tasting about 12 bottles of wine, we end up, we're freestyle rapping about food and wine because this guy's got beats going. It was just, it was fantastic. I said, I will be back. This is weekly. I'll be back. I'll be back every week for sure. And one of the things that really impressed me with that wine tasting was somebody guessed, oh, this is a 1973 Vouvray. And I just thought that was just a fantasy foot 5,000 guess. I didn't think that was even possible that we were tasting that wine. Sure enough, he was right. And so I said, okay, I'm definitely coming back because not only was that really fantastic wine to be tasting, but this guy, he had some idea of what attributes to look for to, to make that call, you know? And so I want to learn. And so I was able to ask him, hey, what was that? You know? And so as you're able to ask people what their guesses were and why, you're able to learn so much and so quickly. And so you start to gain a frame of reference. And so we started doing those blind tastings every week for a long time. And during those blind tastings, Jim would bring some of the old Arterberry wines that were made in the 80s. And it would be blind. But sometimes Jim and one of the other guys who was in this group 
would have access to some really deep cellars. And sometimes just smelling a wine in the blind, you would know, oh, wow, whoever brought this, thanks for sharing. You know, because it was just, it was a, it was a different wine, you know, possibly aged or more rustic or just there was something that would stand out about the wines that you knew were really special and turns out some of them were 1980s Arterberry wines or 1980s Chateau Neuf or you know some old you know really nice cellar wines so you could actually get a frame of reference for how wine ages you know and so this really started to give you a firm grasp for your sensory perception and how to even approach a wine that you don't know mm -hmm. because you don't need to look at the label you just can approach the wine as it is and so this was so cool and during these tastings tasting some of those arterberry wines jim said listen i want to revive this old label this old arterberry label and um, he said, I want to make it Arterberry Marsh. Do you think you can help with that? I said, of course, yeah, let's do it. And he did. He got some fruit. He was able to process that fruit at Cameron Winery. And then we brought that wine up to the cellar at, at Marsh Vineyard, where we are now. And it was five barrels of wine. It was three barrels of Pinot Noir and two barrels of Chardonnay in 2005. And that was 125 cases that quickly grew to what's now about a 5,000 case production. And it was wild. It was, there, was no, there was no pay. And, and, and there wasn't like, in 2006, we actually made the wine at Carlton Winemaker Studio. Went back there for some more punishment from Eric Omaker. I don't know why, but that was a mistake. He was, he was not hospitable. Um, he literally, uh, <laughs> we wanted to use our own basket press because his press was just too large for the volume we wanted to use. And that, for whatever reason, bugged him that we had some way to circumvent his scheduling because we had our own press to set up. And so he was really retentive about the skins that we would have produced on the ground, even though we were basically set up next to the pumice bin where there were skins everywhere. There was debris everywhere but he wanted to make sure our debris was cleaned up every skin every night well we're tenants at this place and we had seen some of the things that he had done with tenants before because we'd both worked there before some of the things he would asked me to do there before were wild and so it was just it was very clear that he was just being petty and so uh we quickly realized okay well this is a mistake we won't make wine here anymore and so we got in and out of carlton winemaker studio and went up to tory moore winery and that's where we met Jacques Tardy and John Tomaselli. And they treated us like sons and brothers. I mean, it was awesome. It was a new facility, first of all, which was cool. We got, got to help them establish a flow at a new facility, but we had all the things we needed and we didn't encounter any sort of attitudes like we had at the Carlton Winemaker Studio. Um, I've never seen a more accessible winemaker than Jock Tardy. There wasn't a question I ever had where he wouldn't stop what he was doing, answer my question, and then go back to what he was doing. And this was not just when I worked there. And when I worked there for him, I did the lab analysis for him. So we shared a small office together all day, every day, and talked very little. But any question I ever had, he was so accessible and it was really an incredible resource. And so subsequently, as I have not worked with Jock at Tory Moore, I've always been able to return and ask him any question, any question about anything. And he would stop what he's doing. If he didn't know the question off the top of his head or didn't have a program to figure out what I wanted to know, he would get out textbooks, maybe three, and start looking things out. I mean, so accessible, such a gracious, kind, winemaker. So he was the winemaker at Tory Moore and still still is um, in I think from 2006 through currently and uh, he's made some exceptional wines for for Tory Moore and so then the other man I mentioned was John Tomaselli who was his assistant winemaker and this is the man when I said sons and brothers Jock treated us like sons John treated us like brothers because you know he was closer to our age group but he was also just terrific. This guy could get the best out of anybody. 
And that was the same thing I experienced with Tyson Crowley when we worked at ERATH. He could get the best out of anybody. He knew how to approach you where you were. I am getting better about that. <laughs> uh, and so John, he did. He really knew how to be a leader. He had to rope a team together and how to make people get along and, and enjoy what we were doing. And so we did. And we worked at Tory Moore for several years making the wines of Arterbury Marsh. And so the fortune we had to work with the fruit that we make those wines from, that's where the success from that label comes from. Um, the fruit was planted in 1969 by Jim's grandfather, Jim Arterbury, or Jim Marsh, excuse mm -hmm. me. And Jim Marsh planted those grapes at behest of Dick Erath. A neighbor walked up and said, listen, your property is perfect. And as he says it, I was looking at 100 tons of prunes that weren't going to sell. So I said, all right, let's do it. He started pulling those prunes out that day. And it was a really good idea, apparently, because, uh, you know, so many years later and 50 acres of vines and old vine, own rooted vines that have not been touched by phylloxera and the wines that have been touched by phylloxera are pretty limited. Mm -hmm. um, these are expressing a different character, a different, more rustic, soil expressive character in the wines than the rootstock that we see now, the American rootstock. And what happens a lot of the time with people planting vineyards today is they're irrigating their vineyard. And the detriment to the vines when a vineyard is irrigated is that the roots will be shallow mm -hmm. and you will end up missing out on so much of the substrata that comprises the makeup of your soil. And a lot of times these vineyards, we're planting them on hills. Mm -hmm. And so within a hill, you have so many hundreds of feet of soil to work with. And if your vines are only going into the top 10 feet, I feel like you're leaving a lot of meat on the bone, you know, you're leaving money on the table there. And I feel like anything you can do to encourage deep roots is going to be a benefit to your final outcome and your final wine that you're going to taste. Mm -hmm. And so back when these vines were planted, we didn't know any better and didn't have an option for American root stock. So this was basically a lucky experiment that we were able to see the fruits from still. And those fruits have, have developed a label that has just a great deal of demand. And so the fortune has smiled on us from not only the winemaking aspect for the Arterberry label, because as that label abruptly ended, there was still a lot of demand for those wines. And so when Jim was eight years old, his father, Fred Arterberry, died. And so the winery stopped. So when Jim became of age, he decided, you know what, I like wine, let me, let me pursue this. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge gap there in demand. So when that wine came back on the market, it was gobbled up. And so not only do we have the fortune of the demand for the label, but then the fortune of the actual fruit to work with and the actual land. It's just, an, just a match made. And so the wines have been so successful that way. Um, because you have just this perfect combination of climate, of the varietal selection, of the soil, then you have the vine age, then you have this winemaking philosophy of not screwing it up that Jim also appreciated. And so we were able to team up and make really, really fantastic wines. And, um, and we were able to do that consistently one of the ways we were able to do that is by not having the money or access to a bunch of new barrels. And so when we have wine in neutral cooperage, then we're not adding a lot of, uh, we're not adding flavors that are going to get in the way of your perception of the wine. And it's just so easy to see that as wines age, maybe, uh, you age faster or um, maybe not for as many years, but Pinot Noir is naturally not a deep, long ager. 
And if it is, that's great. But if you're doing unnatural things to make it age longer, you might wonder if that's going to be a uh, helping or hurting. Mm -hmm. And so for so many of the wines that we made early on, they're very rustic and very neutral wood wines. And this is a style that I really appreciate. And when we're tasting wines in the blind, you can definitely pick this up. And this is what's so cool to do. If you are working in one winery all the time, chances are you're primarily tasting those wines. And so that was one of the big eye openers working in a kitchen is you're tasting all the wines on a list. And so I got out of what's called a house mouth or a cellar palate where I'm focused on the wines. You know, we're tasting all the time. If you have 1,500 barrels in a cellar, you're tasting a lot of wine all the time and it's primarily those vineyards and that wine. And so that was one of the eye openers working in a kitchen is tasting all the different wines and get, getting away from that focus palette and getting a broader perspective on wine altogether. And so with these blind tastings, we're able to see a broader perspective of what we would like to emulate or when we taste wines in the blind that we appreciate like oh hey I'm, I'm into this I can't wait to find out what it is mm -hmm. and when we find out that it's a wine that somebody's making in Croatia or in Austria then that is just exciting to find out that there are so many places around the world that are making not just exceptional but truly great wine mm -hmm. and uh, it just it tells me that there are so many wine regions left to be developed you know uh, just because people just haven't tried it yet mm -hmm. I mean for whatever reason there are so many hillsides here in Yamhill County that I think that's that's gonna be a vineyard soon <laughs> you know and for whatever reason it is not already based on who owns the property you know they're not interested in alcohol or they're not interested in wine or they're not interested in cutting those trees yet for whatever reason but I can see a lot of development coming and one of the things that attracted me to wine in the first place was the cottage industry aspect where everybody was cooperating I know when we needed something at Erath and we couldn't get it at the supply store there was a couple of other wineries we can call and say hey do you have extra filter pads? I'll get you back when they come in. Yeah, no problem. So some of my job was running over to another winery and meeting another winemaker and saying, hey, yeah, Tyson sent me over here to pick up filter pads. Oh, hey, cool, nice to meet you. Here's a bottle of our wine and some beer. <laughs> you know, it was just such a, like, a camaraderie. And it was really, it was really incredible to see. And I was, you know, 19 but before I worked in the wine industry I was seeing it from friends of mine who who were already involved in it and they were describing it to me and as somebody who isn't old enough to drink talking about being able to drink at work and getting paid for it, it sounded just like a gold mine I said wait a minute run that back again you did what <laughs> and so uh, getting involved in it seemed like a like a dream come true but some of the parties that used to be thrown to celebrate harvest were extravagant. And I'm, I'm talking wild, um, where you know you have 300 people all getting very good time intoxicated and in costume and with giant, giant buffets of food for these people to be eating from. It just really looked like a Bacchanal festival. And it used to be Every year, one winery would announce with a good three or four months notice that we'll be hosting this year. So everybody come to our place. And the first one that I was invited to go to was at Willa Kenzie. And the guy there had a lot of money, I'm sure you know. Uh, he threw a very, very cool party. And uh, it, it just it turned my mind on to what was possible out here. I just, I didn't realize just the scope of, you know, having that cottage industry uh, look at it and then seeing the giant, giant money side of it and all of the huge stainless steel tanks and the most beautiful ornate barrel rooms. I just thought, wow, this place is cool. I want to be involved here. So it was just, 
it was just a, a, an unbelievable unfolding when I saw how fun it was to work with these guys, how cool the final product was, and how much there is to wine and how many things there are to learn. And that is the least boring job you can have when you're constantly learning. So it was just, it was a no brainer. Definitely one of the more interesting answers I've ever had to that question. So, to why so, wine? So, so thank you for that, yes. So I'm, <laughs> I'm curious, you mentioned uh, that you, you were kind of the introduction you were given is glorified dishwasher and then, and then it'll grow from there. So I'm curious, with that kind of description, uh, tell me how the work unfolded for you and, and what about the work itself was appealing? Well, coming from an industrial aspect, like I said, from asphalt, uh, there was so much industrial as application to a large production, like 40,000 cases. Mm -hmm. You know, you're moving a lot of weight around and you're cleaning up a lot of stuff. And when I was at that asphalt work, like I said, those guys were trying to get me to stand on my shovel and lean on it. They did not want me to be raking and working while the work was happening. And I, I just, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I was like young and strong and ready to work. And I wanted to show my worth. I wanted to be, you know, effective. And they didn't want me to do that. They were like, look, we're going to be here for 40 years. You just need to slow down, Junior. And they said, let me show you how to use that shovel. And so they grabbed it from me. They set it on the ground, tilt it over a little bit and lean on it. They said, this is how you use the shovel. You just stand here and you need to relax. So one of the hardest things you can get paid to do is just stand still. And that's what they were asking me to do. They were like, look, you're making us look bad, you know? And so when I went into this industrial application and they appreciated my vigor and they wanted me to help get things done faster and be effective, I really, really thrived on that, you know? Then I had somebody who was, uh, like I said, like a good coach. Tyson was a quarterback in high school. So he's really a good leader, you know, and just a very dynamic guy. And I have two brothers that are the same age as Tyson. And so I already had a good uh, rapport for that, I don't know, for that age group, that, um, that generation, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so he was able to utilize that vigor and actually hone the skills for production management, actually use that the right way, I guess, is, is a good way to put it. And so I was a lineman playing football in high school. And so that was also a great dynamic where I was able to take direction from a good leader. If I had a good leader, you know, it was easy to go along with the program. And so um, we would do things like stretch in the morning for half an hour before we'd start working. I mean, really smart things to do, like just calm down, talk about what we're gonna do today, have a little coffee, you know, he was, just awesome, just dynamic. And so um, the work, the, the actual work doing the job, it was just, it was so um, rewarding, or I guess there was a sense of accomplishment mm -hmm. all the time. You turn around and look what was what just happened and, and you're, you're happy about it. You may not have even thought what you were gonna do was possible and now it is, it's done. Mm -hmm. For instance, you would see all of these trucks showing up, unloading all of these bins of fruit and you know what has to happen to it and you're standing there at the sorting deck going, oh boy. And you see another truck, you're like, oh boy. Like I knew we were gonna be here all night, but oh, boy, we're gonna be busy all night too. And um, having that like, it's not a deadline, it's like a production goal. And it's not a time production goal. It's a, there's a very real tangible number of tons that we have to process today. Here's your challenge, let's go. And there are certain things that have to happen the right way. And if something screws up, you need to be able to on the fly fix it pretty quick before it keeps screwing up and goes further. And so it was just, you know, you're working with very large tanks. We had a couple of tanks that were 8,000 gallons. And so when that's full of liquid, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Um, one of the first interns that I worked with, he was from Austria. And so I told you that's where my heritage. And so I was really excited to be working with this guy, George, and his accent was great. Oh yeah, Mike. Oh, this is great. This winery is beautiful. And uh, we get, he wants to show me, he already knows what to do. His parents have a winery in Austria. We had a program at our winery where we had the cheap kind of valves on the bottom of our tanks, where we had 3,800 gallons fermenting in this tank 
we had a plastic ball valve at the bottom. And so the concern was that ball valve could succumb to that pressure, so we would keep a cap on those and keep the valve open so that we don't break the valve. We just keep a cap on it. Well, George was very happy to show me that he already knew how to hook up this pump over that I, I wanted to show him. And so he went right over there and pulled the cap off and we're standing there and three inches of wine is hitting us and spraying everywhere. And I reached out and I shut the valve and he looked at me, he goes, oh, it's always just the one was open. <laughs> I said, yes. And I pointed out the other tanks, do you see? They're all open, but a cap. But, oh, <laughs> it was really, really fun work. I mean, there was, there was stuff like that all the time where you're interacting with people who have a completely different perspective. Um, people from uh, Chile, there was a woman from Chile who, you know, she explained to us that even she had just come from wine school and she said even though she was on the team in a production facility there, she would not be allowed to do things like sweep up or shovel things that wouldn't be the other guys if they would stand around and let her do that they would be like count against their macho you know and so she was very surprised that we were asking her to actually do some of the work that we were doing and and it, it took some uh some adjustment for her but she told me one day after after work we're sitting there having a break before she said good night and i went my back to home she says mike you know I don't want, you know, cleaning the same machine for two, two and a half hours. I only want smoking marijuana and being on holiday. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, well, you know, that's going to have to be a different kind of job for you, <laughs> I think. So it's really, really cool to see so many different people. I mean, there was a guy from New Zealand who was a boxer who had turned into a champagne maker. And he was just a real hard, hard man. He was a real hard dude. He was rude, but he was funny. And he was really good to work with. He knew how to be effective. He knew how to get a lot of wine moved around. You know, he comes from a different, different uh, size industry. Yeah. But, you know, it was just the work that we were doing was just a really, really fun balance of industrial application and art. Mm -hmm. And um, not to mention um, kind of being thrown in the deep end because we're kind of up there having to do stuff that we were not necessarily qualified to do, especially at my age, you know? I mean, there was a lot of things that, you know, without proper training, maybe shouldn't have been doing. Um, an example of that was one young lady from, um, Chile, her name was Pia, she was tiny. We had a very high pressure lees filter. And if that thing is under pressure and it's full, then it's taking all this diatomaceous earth and creating cakes out of it. And that cake is then filtering out particles in the wine. Well, when it's time for that to be emptied, the pressure has to be let out slowly before you can open it. Mm -hmm. And it's under a lot of hydraulic press. And she didn't really know how to do that and myself and Remy were out in the courtyard discussing I don't know what and all of a sudden we heard some yelling coming from inside the cellar. Help! My Remy! Help! And we came around the corner and out in the breezeway, the breezeway is probably 30 feet wide and across from the opening in the cellar door on the other side of the breezeway, 30 feet across, there's a wall and it is splattered with Lee's from that filter. And we come in and she is standing right next to it and her face was right in front of the valve where all that pressure came out. And she's standing right in front. She's going, my eyes, my eyes, I can't see. Remy and I ran in there and we got her to the little eye rinsing station and she was fine, but it was real, like it was an eye opener. Like, hey, we're kind of out here while westing it, you know, and, um, it, it was just, it was, that made it even more sense of accomplishment that we were able to harness some of these very high and dangerous pressures or other applications and, and with, with true professional precision. And that's what, you know, Tyson had in mind is he was very precise and very professional and, and the same with Rob. Stewart. They, they just, they really were so dialed in for such a large production and such a limited 
production facility. It did not have all the things that you would really want to have. Um, when that winery sold, the new owners just, they didn't even try to retrofit the facility. They just moved out. Um, but that sense of accomplishment was huge. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, a cellar full of 1500 barrels and any given time, several of them are leaking. And so I've got to go in there with a little hammer and a little nail set and tap in there and find, first I have to find the hole. And if I can find it, hopefully it isn't buried in a location where I really have to crawl in because if it's stacked behind several hundred barrels, the, um, the point of diminishing return for digging all those barrels out and finding that one leak and fixing it and then putting it all back in, it, it, it shows up really quickly. The point of diminishing return shows up really quickly with volumes like that. And so uh, we did, we had to be able to fix barrels. We had to just run in and, and do whatever it took. And one of the things about being able to fix a barrel like that is turning around and having that sense of accomplishment. Maybe it even took you 45 minutes of banging your knuckles, of getting dirty, of laying in a puddle of nasty wine that's been leaking for weeks, you know? But once you actually get it done and you fix that barrel, you can fix any barrel, especially if you're at a smaller facility and you can absolutely get that barrel isolated and have it to yourself. And so it's just, you don't know it at the time when things seem like they're so frustrating or so, um, I don't know, like, uh, hard that they're making life easier for you later it's just there's been so many barrels that i've fixed later and that's one thing that i mentioned earlier about making wine in neutral wood it's really hard to do because it's hard to maintain a barrel especially a barrel that's 20 years old that's just there's very few people who are going to be able to use that barrel after it's 20 years old very few people who are using barrels that are older than seven years and so the ability to maintain a neutral barrel is huge and um, I didn't realize at the time how much I was going to lean on that skill at Arterberry because we have so many old barrels. We don't really get rid of barrels. <laughs> we keep those in use. We'll maybe buy, you know, two, three new barrels a year. And uh, those are usually for white wine. So, um, yeah, the, the work was rewarding in just about every aspect. Um, being able to handle compressed gas, um, being able to figure out the logistics of bottling and um, being able to figure out gallons, how they're going to move, what you're going to lose, why it's lost, how to document this stuff. All of this stuff was just, you know, at a young age, it was so... Um, so mind-blowing and so uh, rewarding to be able to, you know, I guess master that um, without any without any previous training, you know. And so I started there uh, for Harvest in 99, and by Christmas, Rob had let me know that I'd be coming back um, as cellar master after the break because he wanted to move Tyson up to assistant winemaker. And so Tyson was definitely on board with that. He had been, he had, started training me that way from the get-go because he just he felt like we were going to get along he's like yes here we go and so when rob had a deal to buy that winery from dick erath um he had planned that tyson would move up and be the winemaker when he left and dick renegotiated the deal with rob and he wasn't going to sell it to to Rob. And so Rob took his investment and went and, and made his own winery. Mm -hmm. And so when that all happened and Rob left, and this was our fearless leader, like I said, created this unbelievable workplace. When he left, Dick didn't move Tyson up. He hired a different guy. And when he did that, it changed everything. It changed the dynamic, but this guy didn't like me. Mm -hmm. And so he told Tyson, hey, look, you know, I don't, I don't like this guy. I'm gonna get rid of him. And Tyson said, look, don't do that. I've been, I've been training this guy. I've been working with this guy. This is my guy. Well, it, it changed the whole thing and it really soured my, um, I guess my idea of, of what you get out of putting your heart into a place. You know, because we really had not just myself, but everybody who worked there. And that's what I loved about it so much. There was so much heart there. And it really, it was a wake up call. Mm -hmm. I, 
even though I was cognizant, like, hey, Dana, savor this, because this is, you know, we're, we're not going to have this again. I didn't realize that, you know, when it showed up, it showed up. And so this guy, he says, no, Mike's got to go. And so, so Mike had to go. So um, Tyson went his way, and I went my way to learn how to cook. And it was a, it was a different sense of accomplishment learning how to cook and, and making good plates, but it wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. And so I did several other things too. I went and I framed houses and um, in between working in wine again and coming back to wine and cooking. And I did a lot of other things that, you know, required a lot of skill and focus at the same time. And nothing, nothing gave me the same reward as, as winemaking had. And so it was clear that I needed to stay, mm -hmm. stay in, in, the, in wine production. And so um, in 2004, I went over to Coleman. Um, that's out here on Latham Road, outside of McMinnville. And uh, it was just, it was not, a, it wasn't the best fit for me uh, as far as personality was concerned. And so, um, Shortly after I realized that wasn't a good fit, I also got diagnosed with testicular cancer. And so that was a real easy out. I told him, look, I'm not going to be there for harvest. When really, that was true. I did. I was going through chemotherapy. I also had an opportunity to go work at Brick House with Doug Tunnell. And so that was really, really brilliant. So like I said, the... Personality wasn't exactly a fit at Coleman. It was just an absolute brilliant person to work with at Brick House. Uh, Doug Tunnell, he was so knowledgeable and so well spoken, and um, he would have, you know, printouts for us to read before lunch every day. We'd take lunch at the same time every day, and he would usually have something good for us to eat. But he would have printouts um, about the current political situation uh, with different articles. So each of us had a different article, and we would read that, and then we would discuss. You know, I mean, these lunches were really quite a bit more stimulating than some of the things we did at Coleman. So, <laughs> uh, so it was a great contrast and a great place to work there because he had a real focus on, um, again, like I said, light, elegant no touch winemaking and so we were really able to you know kind of walk through the vineyards it's such a small production that we're able to really get intimate intimately familiar with the vineyards what we're doing differently for the different vineyards and why and uh it was just like a it was a great place to be for that time in my life because it was a really hard vintage going through chemo was not a cakewalk and so um, that was just a, a, a wildly fortuitous blessing to have those people to work with during that you know tough time mm -hmm. and uh, so then um, in 2006 Jim and I were were starting to, to make Arterberry Marsh wine mm -hmm. and uh, some of the some of the people that uh, Jim put me in contact with were um, Dave and Tina from Tina's. And so I worked with them uh, cooking in 2006 and 2007. And that was just a great place to work. Again, it was like the magic of Nick's downtown where there was so much history and so many good times had happened in that space that you could almost still feel it. You know what I mean? It was, there was a magic to the place. And so being a part of that, again, it was like, it was something to be. Um, it was something to be savored at the time. You know, some of the family meals that we had there together after we're done. That is again the sense of accomplishment where you've gone through and fed 90 people just some incredible food, and now it's your turn. Mm -hmm. You know, drink and eat and be merry. And then when you have gone through that shift with those people, you know you're all at the same spot or. You've all contributed to that success. So now it's really time for a celebration every time. And so that sense of accomplishment, again, it, it really spoke to me. Mm -hmm. But the pay just isn't there. It's just, as far as the pay is concerned, a pretty thankless job mm -hmm. for most of the cooks in this country. 
and so it's greasy and hard work and you're up late at night and by the time you're done cooking and having like I said that staff meal you're ready to drink and so you go out and you drink and you drink until closing and then by the time you have had enough to drink or the bars have closed the only food options are very very poor food options and so you make that food decision you know bad food decision you go to sleep on that and you get up and you do it all over again and so I quickly saw that the for me and for my uh, sense of self-control the cooking life it just wasn't sustainable I wasn't going to be able to handle that I was definitely wanting to be busy the day relaxing during the night and so um, that sense of accomplishment that I mentioned earlier I was I was getting that from framing houses also in between the wine mm -hmm. and uh, that's something that I still do now is is build and do construction when I'm not busy with wine and it just there's something about putting things together and having it work you know there's something about wine you're building something then you're hoping that it stays together and that works and there's something about that that really feels good and it's craftsmanship mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so uh, that really appealed to me about the work so you talked about after starting in such a big production and such a kind of a, a large kind of sort of chaotic situation you, you you had wanted to get smaller and smaller in terms of wineries so tell me about the transition for you as you got back into wine and started working at smaller places like Brick House and then eventually at, uh, with our, with uh, with Jim, tell me about what the differences are in terms of winemaking at scale, winemaking at smaller size, and, and what appealed to you about the smaller size as you were getting, especially as you were getting started with with uh, the Marsh, the new Marsh brand. Well, when we were working in such a large facility, you end up seeing uh, other people doing parts of the job that you wanted to be involved with. And now you're not going to because that's going to be finished now. Like once that's done, it's done. Like, oh no, well I missed that part of the job. And so it's like, well hopefully next year I get in on that part of the job because I wanted to learn that as well. And so at a smaller winery, you just end up having to be part of all of the aspects. Let's say you had an interest in the vineyard, but it's so large that you're never going to get out there. So at Erath, I never got any time in the vineyard. I wanted to get out in the vineyard, never get out in the vineyard. There's too much work to be done in the cellar. And so at a smaller winery you have to know everything or you don't have to know everything you have to learn everything mm -hmm. and um, you have to put your hands in everything and that appealed to me because it wasn't um, it wasn't that there was aspects of the work that I didn't want to do it was that I wanted time to do all of it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you if you only have let's say 200 barrels well then you have time to focus on those and you have time to taste all those and you have time to know all of that wine. If you have 1500 barrels, you have to be really diligent about tasting that wine and you have to be tasting a lot. And we would, and, and Rob was really good about that, Eddie Brath. I mean, he was really good about getting this in the cellar, tasting wines. And what he would do is he would select the wines that we were gonna taste first, because we had so many different vineyards that we would work with. He would select, before we would get in there at all, he would select the wines that we were going to taste. And in his mind, he had experiments for what we would taste in those wines. Mm -hmm. Then he would ask our perception, and then he would give us the actual key. Well, these were these wines, and this, this is what you did or didn't like. Mm -hmm. And so it was so mind-opening as far as the differences between vineyards or the difference between, between practices in a vineyard. Mm -hmm. So for instance, one of the biggest experiments that stands out for me that he would do to us blind was machine harvested versus hand harvest. I mean, intuitively you think hand harvest wine, that's going to taste better. Every single time in the blind, we were selecting for the machine harvest wines. Every single time, and it was unanimous. It was all three of us who were tasting. So it would be Rob, Tyson, Dana, and myself. And this would happen once a week for a couple of years. And different vintages of this wine, mm -hmm. you know, at any point we would have two or three vintages of this wine in the cellar at a time. And we would do it year after year. It was really incredible um, the way Rob would structure a tasting. And then later, after working with Rob, I would attend one of his tastings where he would actually do a professional tasting where consumers would show up and he would walk you through how to taste a wine or how to pair different 
actual food elements with wine elements. And that was really, really mind opening uh, as far as the way different food can accentuate or drag down a profile of a wine palate. And so tasting with Rob in those cellar tastings just through our barrels all of the time was very, very important for learning how to approach a wine, just how to break down a wine, just how to mm -hmm. taste the wine, just mm -hmm. the structure of a wine. But again, that's focused on just the wines that we were making, Pinot and Chardonnay primarily. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of different varietals in there that Dick had experimentally grown. You know, Arnais, Dolcetto, um, things that weren't necessarily going to work, but I think the closest one that he could have found to work was Tempranillo that we were working with. Mm -hmm. but. Those were all just experimental volumes, and uh, it was fun to taste those as well, mm. but there was just so much to like about the work. Mm. There was just so, so many aspects. Tell me about getting a brand started then. Tell me about working, working with, my, uh, with my gym to get that started. How, how did it work? How did you, what were you focused on in, in the early days, uh, and, and how did you sort of relaunch that brand? Well, that's, um, I mean, that was something that Jim had asked me if I could help him with. He was already decided to do that, but he has a friend in the Dundee Hills who was kind of like an older brother to him that grew up on the other side of the hill. His name's Jesse Lang. And Jesse approached Jim. I mean, he used to shoot one-on-one -on -one hoops with Jim and just really took him under his wing like a little brother from a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And he said, listen, Jim, the trademark for Arterberry's expired and it's going to cost this much to get it back. Here's a check for that amount. Go get that. You should do it. And so that was really the, like, that was the last push Jim needed. He had already decided to do it, but then he had that kind of encouragement and support from a, another member mm -hmm. of the community. And that's kind of what I was touching on before is that camaraderie in that cottage industry where people understand how to best support each other because they've been there possibly or because they've seen somebody else, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, that made it a no brainer. Like, okay, now now you own the trademark. Now the, the question is just getting fruit in the bucket, mm -hmm. you know? And as far as selling the wine, like I said, the demand already existed. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you don't make more volume than you can sell, you're going to be in a great catbird seat. But it's as soon as you grow, you... A lot of people enter this industry from uh, data points and they say, well, if I make this number of bottles and sell them for this number per bottle, then I can make this number of dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, th it doesn't pencil out that way. It, uh, you don't sell all those bottles all at one time and you don't sell them all to one person. And, the uh, way that those bottles get out to consumer is frankly convoluted. And so the more wine you can sell direct to consumer, the more of the profit you can take home and the less hassle you have to incur. And um, I personally find compliance to be a hassle and it is intricate and different for every mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. And so, it's um, it's amazing uh, how hard it can be to make that wine disappear. And people don't anticipate that challenge when they start a winery. And so uh, there's a lot of investment to be made and uh, that investment doesn't return. And so when people enter this industry from data points, they uh, end up making a lot of decisions that have a detrimental impact on the final impact, on the final product, mm -hmm. the wine. Mm -hmm. And one of those decisions is irrigation. And uh, another decision is cellar time. Another decision is buying new wood because they see wines achieve score potential and they go and they buy those wines that have achieved these high scores and they taste them and they taste new wood and so they say, okay, well then that is one of the characteristic traits of a high scoring wine, I need to have that. Mm -hmm. And so this I think has had a detrimental impact on the wines of this area is influx of people who make wine from a perspective of data points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I see a lot of people moving away 
from new wood, but I, I don't think it's nearly enough. Um, and then I think that I see people trying to exaggerate the extraction of their wines. And I think that's also making an impact on what people have come to expect from Oregon wine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's only so many wines that are on the list in the rest of the country that are from Oregon. And if three out of five of those wines is big and jammy and over extracted with a lot of new wood, people have a skewed perception of what elegant even means, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so. Um, it's, it's very interesting to see the people who have come at this from a point of artistry or a point of um, creative endeavor or a point of business. Mm -hmm. And so we certainly came at this without even considering the challenges of the business side. <laughs> That's one, that's one way to do it. Well, of course, we wanted the money, but we had no idea how to fill our bucket with the money. We knew we were really pretty sure we could fill our bucket with the grapes. We just didn't know how we could fill that bucket with the money, but we were sure that we could with wine if we tried. Mm -hmm. So we tried, but, you know, in 2006, it was, you know, it was plain stated between us. Jim was like, look, I, I probably won't even be able to pay you anything until 2009 till we start selling some wine, you know, and... <laughs> That, you know, that's a tough thing to consider where you're like, okay, well, I have to think of other things to do to support myself while I do all of this hard work for free. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it's an interesting conundrum. And so it's been tough. And I've seen a lot of people in the industry make really good money with a lot less skills and experience than myself, but make good living wage working for some of these larger companies with a degree mm -hmm. and I just I never went to school like I said I went right into asphalt then into hard winemaking and then stayed here in working when I was young I did not really like the idea of going to school I didn't like the idea of the debt I saw my brother and crew and so I said look I would rather learn and make money while I'm learning than spend money and party and I also knew about my own self-control don't I, I didn't think I was do very well around all the partying and I didn't think it would mix well with the reading you know I just didn't, I didn't know how well that would work so I figured I would do better at work and uh, so now I see and my brother tried to tell me he said look if you don't go to school you're gonna find yourself having peers that are younger than you that are ahead of you and I did not know what he meant and he was right he really is I see peers who are ahead of me based on a degree mm -hmm. you know and so it's one thing that I need to uh, approach about my own, my own winemaking is there, like I said before, the part about this job that is just always so fulfilling is always learning. But that's the one thing I have to do still is a lot of learning. There are so many holes in my own winemaking skills and knowledge. And that is one of the most beautiful parts about this career and lifestyle is that you will never be finished learning about the different aspects about wine about the different varieties that exist mm -hmm. there are just so many just within the country of Italy <laughs> and so it's just been um, it's been a never look back situation as far as um, what I do it differently no I would certainly not I would, what I would have done differently is take more pictures I really wish I would have taken more pictures when we were at Erath especially because, like I said, there were so many beautiful people that we interacted with from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I don't have pictures to describe those people, so I could try to describe it, but you can't, you can't see their face. When you see somebody's eyes, you see their humanity. You can't see those faces. And I wish I could show people those faces because they were there. When you work vintage with somebody, it feels like a, like a kindred, you know, like a brother or sister, you mm -hmm. know, and so... That, that part of it also, it stays with you for the rest of uh, appreciating life, you know, so, yeah. You talked about your winemaking skill. I'm, I'm curious, tell me how your sort of style and skill have developed over time and, and how you would describe the wines you make now or, or what the wines you make should be. Mm. 
Um, well, uh, like I said, being expressive of the site is really important. Um, and the varietal that will work in an area, that's, I mean, it's so subjective and the climates in an area are always changing. And then also the predominant sites in an area could be a higher elevation, but if you're working with a different elevation, there's most likely a different variety that's going to work better in that elevation and that soil type. And so the style that I would like to see is just more true. You know, there are a lot of people who are making wines that are outside of their traditional style to exaggerate one aspect or another of that variety. And um, I think as you see people looking closer to a true stylistic variety, uh, you're going to be able to express a area more uh, specifically and more, um, I guess, more effectively. You know, you can, you can definitely express more from this valley floor with Muscat than you can with Pinot Noir, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I would like to see that, for instance. Um, Riesling, I think, has a great deal of potential for some of the surrounding areas around here for a cool climate ripening. But I think some of the wines that I like to drink the most are cool climate ripening varietals. Um, and so that tends to be what I focus on when I look for potential around here. And obviously this is a cool climate still. As it warms up in certain areas of Oregon, there are varieties that I think will work really well. I think that Malbec is a great wine to plant. I think Sangiovese is a great wine to plant. I mean, some of the wines that I've been enjoying recently have been Chiantis that are just so elegant and they just, they dance with food so well, you could just about eat them with anything. And so it's just, it's a really cool uh, thing to consider when you start to consider that, hey, the, the number of varieties that we can produce in this area is not limited to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. However, I would like to see people planting more of the right kinds of Chardonnay. And so many people have a lot of Dijon clone Chardonnay planted. And this is a choice that will have been directed by data points mm -hmm. because it's not a choice that will have been directed by art. <laughs> um, the variety of Chardonnay that I think will make the most rewarding final product in Oregon is Wente Selection Chardonnay. It's also known as Chardonnay 72. Uh, there is another one called Draper Selection. And I think that those two selections of Chardonnay can make the largest and most meaningful impact on the way Oregon Chardonnay is tasting and is perceived. It is absolutely one-sided right now. And by one-sided, I mean the aspects that I find most predominant from the Dijon clone Chardonnays are more of a green apple side of Chardonnay and a more of a, um, a uh, tart side. And some of the aspects that you can see coming from Draper and from Wente selection are much more earthy and gold or tan or um, sun-kissed and um, in such a good way. And I don't mean in a buttery way or overripe way. They're just, I guess, better suited to this climate. I, I can't explain why this genetic material is making these wines taste so much better. But if you taste these wines side by side, you will see that you have a clear preference. And hopefully I get a chance someday to pour them for you blind side by side. And you can tell me what your preference is without knowing, mm -hmm. you know, and this is one of the most effective ways to get a frame of reference for yourself is to taste wines blind. And then you can, you can really see what your preference is and you'll start to understand why, you know, as you investigate further, um, what, what soil was this? Was this old world or new world? That's a great way to start, you know. Um, the potential for Chardonnay here has a different potential than it does in the old world based on vine age and then based on clonal selection, based on root selection. There's just so much. So 
the things that we can do now, it, it's so young, you know, you're talking about hundreds of years of Lion Age over there. It's so young now. There are things that you can do now that in a hundred years will have such a terrific impact on what the grandchildren are looking at and tasting, you know. <laughs> Are there, as uh, as your work has grown and as and as Artemis Marsh has grown, are there sort of milestones along the way that you look back on fondly? Are there accomplishments along the way that kind of made it feel like you were doing the right thing or on the right path? Oh, certainly. There, there's. It's always nice to get accolades, you know, and and those have been forthcoming in, in a great number of uh, publications. For my part of those personally, I haven't been mentioned in those accolades and in those publications. And that's hard because it feels like I have had a great deal of uh, contribution and especially in the early days without any pay. And so if you're not going to get the money, you might need to get some, uh, at least some accolades, you know, and, and so those have not been forthcoming. And so that's been a frustration, but it's also been uh, the milestones from those have been rewarding in in and of themselves where you're 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 being reminded that you're not guessing about the craftsmanship that you're putting forth it's it's being corroborated your your guesses are being corroborated by experts internationally and and, and it's coming back roses mm -hmm. and so then that happens consistently year after year after year for a track record of you know 15 years in a row then you start to realize no not just guessing but actually putting in the, the the work and the time and the effort and staying out of it, you know, also having the restraint to not do too much. And it's just, it's, it's, it's amazing because you can get what's known as imposter syndrome, where you're, you're making these decisions that are going to have a great deal of impact stylistically, and you're possibly thinking in the back of your head like, Oh, are they going to taste this and know that I have no business making wine? <laughs> you know, even though that's just such a preposterous thought, it, it happens. People, mm -hmm. I've talked to other winemakers who have expressed this same imposter syndrome where like they're worried somebody's going to taste this and know that they're not worth it. And that's just so preposterous, especially when it comes to art. You know, if there's somebody who doesn't appreciate, art, appreciate your art, they're most likely going to be in the minority. Mm -hmm. So... It's so important to be able to remind yourself, like, uh, this is this is the right way, and for the people who don't like it, that's fine. You cannot account for their taste, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so there have been a lot of uh, really, really, really rewarding scores as far as different international publications. There have been nice articles and nice reviews and tasting notes about the wines and there have been people who have done you know blind tastings online where they will sit there and taste the wine blind and then they'll reveal it mm -hmm. oh the artie berry marsh blah, 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 and they'll go on and you know it's it's very rewarding to see some of those compliments from people who had absolutely no intention of complimenting you personally it was complimenting the craftsmanship that you'd put forth and that's that's really what you're trying to do is like i said not screw it up <laughs> So I want to talk about 2020 a little bit and, and kind of a couple a couple of diff different things that happened last year. So uh, I'm curious, uh, COVID hitting last spring, tell me about sort of initial impact and initial reaction to it on, on your case, sort of personally and professionally and, and the decisions and changes you had to make last year to, to make things work. Well, uh, as I mentioned before, as far as selling the wine, it's an advantage to us to be direct consumer. and when that happened, you can't be direct consumer. And if you can, it's very limited. So you just automatically have a lot less income. Mm -hmm. And so that means for me, then we need to figure out less things for me to do. <laughs> and that means I need to get busy doing something else. Mm -hmm. And so this is a dance that we've walked for several years now where I've done construction in addition to the wine. Whenever we're not busy at the winery, I'll go and do construction work. And um, so for me, it's something where I would already have kind of a back door if things were slow at the winery. But yeah, it made a huge impact where all of a sudden, like, I'm not doing any work at the winery and Jim's doing it. And um, 
he's calling me for uh, random stuff every once in a while, you know, but there's no more like, you know, at least three days a week or anything like that. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a definite slowdown. And the thing is, the pandemic and the smoke, they kind of coalesced for a double whammy. So the production volume went down by 60% for us in 2020. But it also, we had a question as to whether or not we had smoke tape. So then we had this wine that we're like, well, we're gonna put everything we can into it, but mm -hmm. what for? Mm -hmm. And so at this point, um, wow. It's one of those things where I feel like I've tried to block it out, kind of, you know, honestly. Uh, it's, it, was a, it was a nightmare. We had foster kids, twins, twin eight-year-olds at the same time during this pandemic. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, we got a call for two foster kids. One was one-year-old and one was three years old. And this was right at the beginning of everything, where everything was starting to shut down in 2019. And I got a call while I was at work at the winery. I was like on autopilot, just having a great day. My life was a lot different without kids. And I got a call saying, hey, uh, they called about a one and a three-year-old. And I said, yes. I said, oh, okay. So when I come home, it's different. When I come home, <laughs> dad, wow. So that was at the beginning of the pandemic, and those kids were with, those kids were with us for about five months, and um, then they went back to mom, and then we got a couple of uh, twins, twin eight-year-olds, a few months ago, and they've gone since. But um, the pandemic has been a huge, huge learning curve with kids thrown into the mix. So it's been like a compound cut. We've been making a 45 angle on a 35 going the other way. I mean, it's been a real, it's been a compound learning, but that's with very little income for the winery. Because if the wine isn't selling, then there's nothing doing. What, you know, it's not, it's not making us money to, to do a lot at the winery. And so uh, it's very expensive to bottle wine. It's, um, very expensive to transport wine. It's very expensive to store wine. And so if you make a volume of wine that is not already sold, you have to anticipate that you're going now to store that wine. And wine storage is very expensive real estate. It's really not cheap. You have to be in the right temperature. So it's, it's such a conundrum. It almost benefits you to keep the wine in barrel as long as you can before you bottle because it's going to cost you the same amount that it was costing you to store that wine in the real estate of Cooperage. It's going to cost you now a new incurred cost to store the wine somewhere else and you're still going to be paying for the same space where you're doing the Cooperage. So it's, it benefits you to keep it in Cooperage as long as you can, if you can. And so for a period like the pandemic where all of the direct -to consumer sales slow and uh, you don't know that the wine's going to move, you kind of just got to slow down, not even bottle. So we did do a bunch of bottling in um, 2021. So we uh, cleared out the cellar quite a bit, but it was um, it definitely a slow time. Mm -hmm. I definitely got a chance to reflect. <laughs> it's a positive way to look at it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, I honestly did. It was, it, it's when you go, go, go all the time, it's nice to slow down. Mm -hmm. It's not nice for the reason to slow down to be that, but mm -hmm. it, it, it was a chance to slow down and really, really take a, uh, a good account of what are we doing up there and, and why, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and how, mm -hmm. you know, there's always ways to improve, but when you need to just get the thing done today, you end up just going ahead and doing it the one way. But when you have time to step back and look, then you can kind of see where you have room to improve. And especially with us for our flow, we have such a small facility. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of ways we can improve that facility. 
getting time to just sit around and daydream about it is something we don't often have the luxury mm -hmm. to do. So you mentioned the other part of 2020, of course, the, the smoke and the fire. So I'm curious, uh, when the fire hit, smoke started rolling in, what were, the, what were the decisions you had to make in the time and, and, and how have the decisions panned out? You mentioned that smoke, not sure about smoke tank yet, so tell, tell me about how it's gone since, since September. Yeah, well, I mean, as you see that, obviously you start to hear some of the people who have uh, funds to be sending out samples immediately and frequently and prolifically, and you start to hear some of the numbers coming back, and you start to hear that they're well past the threshold for consumer perception. Mm -hmm. So you're like, ooh, that doesn't bode well for the wine that we're going to make, because if we're doing all of this work, you know, it's, it's for naught, mm -hmm. you know, and so why even bother? But we weren't in a position where we had the luxury to just not try, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe that's just a personal um, thing where it's just a never say die. So we said, well, we're going to make the wine either way. If it's smoke tainted wine, then it's smoke tainted wine and we'll deal with it from there. But we're not just going to, we just, we weren't going to say no wine. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, I don't have numbers back on our wine. We have neighbors who had numbers coming back that were past the threshold for consumer perception. But as far as the numbers for our wine right now, I don't know where they are. As far as the taste, the wines taste incredible. The stylistic decisions that we made were to minimize contact with skins for a 60% of the production. Mm -hmm. So no Pinot Noir production the way we normally have it. We had, I think, 30 barrels of actual, real, full ferment, red Pinot Noir, and the rest made basically to white Pinot, you know, just directly to the press and pressed off so that we would encounter less contact with the skins that may have absorbed the smoke. Mm -hmm. And that was basically the the protocol. There were a couple of little uh, stabilizer additions that we made to juice and must to um, hopefully mitigate smoke taint, but it was a very minimal amount of uh, intervention that we thought would even be effective. And um, so, like I said, tasting the wines, they taste gorgeous. I don't taste any sort of smoke taint, but it's not up to me. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's not my label. Mm -hmm. It's Jim's mm -hmm. label and it's his call. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens with, with those wines. But if it were up to me, I would bottle those wines and sell them just like any other wine that we've ever made because they taste incredible. Mm -hmm. They're expressive and floral and gorgeous. And I just, it couldn't have happened to a worse vintage as far as the way the fruit ripened in 2020 it was just perfect where you get all the sugar accumulation that you want but then you get all the sugar accumulation stops and you get this protracted aging at the end or not aging but maturation mm -hmm. of skins and and skin wall and it was just what a devastating way to bring fruit in you know and um it was also at some really really just happy, good points of life in other aspects of life where this shows up. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's a good thing that things would be going good enough that when the pendulum swings the other way, it's not going to take you too far down, you know? And that's one of the most beautiful things about this, this career is you see the seasons, you see things go your way, you see things go the other way and you see them come back. You talked earlier about sort of one of the changes you've seen in the industry is perhaps the, 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 the inability to have quite as much fun on the job as you might have had in your early days. That what, comes with the influx of money, what, <laughs> yeah. What are some of the other changes you've seen as you've been a part of the industry? What's different about it now than when you got into it? Yeah, there's money. I mean, money is just, it's just huge. It's, it's flooded into the area. I mean, people who I grew up with cannot afford to live here in this town anymore, you know, and this is why I grew up here in McMinnville. And so I know a lot of people who, when we were going to high school, couldn't wait to get out of here. And now they want to come back and can't afford to, you know, not even close, you know, and even if they could, you can't find a house. And if you do find a house, it will get 
outbid. Mm -hmm. Somebody will come in with a hundred thousand dollars over the top on you, and it's just crazy. And so, the money has. It's not just changed the dynamic of the place, but it's changed the ability of people who do need to live close by to work here. They can't. They cannot afford housing to live here. So it's just, it's wild. It, it, it's changed this place in some ways for a really great positive and some ways for, uh, you would find some people wouldn't appreciate it very much. And so it's interesting to see that where um, money isn't everything, you know? And um, people move to a place from somewhere else and then they tend to want it to be like the place where they came from. And so then you see a lot of change in that regard too. Mm -hmm. And some cultural changes are appropriate and appreciated. Mm -hmm. And and some, you know, we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the advent of vacation rental by owner has been a real alarming trend for the availability and affordability of housing here. And I think that it's a direct impact um, from the wine community and, and from tourism generated by that. And so I think there's a balance to be, to be strived for there. I think that there's improvement to be made there as far as the community reaching out to those people who are having VRBOs and saying, hey, look, you, you're doing something that's helping us, but let us reach back out to the community. You know, let's figure out a way that we're not putting somebody out of a house so that your clients can come in and have a nice place to stay. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a way for people to work together. And I think that this has been one of the best communities to see that, where you're seeing different industries work together mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. achieve yeah, that common goal where, mm -hmm. yeah, let's have a thriving community. Mm -hmm. I think one of the coolest things is the uh, concerts that happen in the evenings on Thursday nights downtown. It's just so cool to see really good acts come down and play for a community of people to come out and dance and hoot and holler. Um, it didn't used to happen. It happens now, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of really good thing that isn't, a lot of really good things that aren't necessarily um, from the wine industry, but that have been a really good positive change in this in this area, and it is community oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, farmers markets are huge everywhere in this country, and the farmers market here has been a tremendously positive impact on on people just seeing each other's faces. Like I mentioned before, you see somebody's eyes, you see the humanity there, and it's a different different world now. Mm -hmm. So. Um, a lot of changes like that uh, have been made and in, in, in for the better. Um, people really do love where they live. The people who live here and the people who move here, they moved here because they love it here for any number of different reasons. Um, but you can see that expressed in you know the shops that are open, the restaurants that are open, the food that's available, um, the ideas that people talk about, you know, the ideas that people come up with, you know, um, you see that with that little marketplace, you know, that's an idea that it just wouldn't have happened 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's a short number of years, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's how, have the, how have the wines changed? Uh, the wines have continued to improve, just, uh, just unbelievable improvement in the wines of this area and across the board and obviously there's always going to be people who are just starting out and they have room for improvement but by and large across the board the wines in this area have continued to improve for the last 30 years every single day every single day there are people out here who are really taking their craft seriously and really really do um, contribute to a to a shining shining organ wine industry um it and it really does it really does shine if you're able to go through and just do a blind tasting of organ wines you'd be really impressed with some of the things that you taste and you might be fooled and think that they were from elsewhere you know from the exemplary mm -hmm. 
place in the world. And so it's really cool to see that, the, the way that people have been able to apply science to art and improve both, mm -hmm. Im improve their understanding of the art and improve the art by understanding. So um, it's really, it's, it's really incredible to see it. It's alchemy is what it mm -hmm. is. You know, it's, it's, it's modern day alchemy when you're, you're really, you're taking sunlight and you're turning it into a beverage, you know, and it's, what's happened to that sunlight, that sunlight and the molecules that have captured that sunlight for you. It, it's just a dream. It's a dream come true. It's just a reminder that yes, this is the way. <laughs> <laughs> so what comes next for the Oregon wine industry? What is the future going to look like as uh, start to come out of the pandemic and all the changes that you've seen? What does the next say five or 10 years look like here in Oregon? Well, I mean, as I've seen it for the last 20 years, I've seen new wineries pop up every single day. And in sometimes, some years, it's like 100 new wineries in a year. You know, it's unreal how much growth there are. I mean, it used, I think in 1999, there were 350 registered wineries in Oregon. And I think now there's something like 900. It's unreal. That is just a staggering number of people who have decided, yep, it is financially viable for me to start a winery mm -hmm. if not just a label but mm -hmm. there are so many people doing this now and so i don't see it slowing down because even in like you said a drastic drought like a pandemic people still drink people may have had an uptick they just already had wine on hand and didn't want to go out and get new stuff <laughs> you know good excuse to start dipping into the cellar i know i took that as a good excuse to drink some of the bottles i've been waiting for <laughs> so i think that you're going to see uh exponential growth still uh it, that's what i've seen so far and i i don't see any reason for it to slow down other than it will be most likely um, fewer and fewer small guys and the larger guys like Jackson family buying those labels and operating them as those labels so you don't necessarily see the label disappear it's just not the same guy operating it anymore mm -hmm. it's what they've done in California and I'm sure it's what they aim to do here mm -hmm. and when I saw them headed this way I thought you know rising tide lifts all ships you know and certainly I haven't seen them degrading the Oregon wine industry at all and mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, research and development um, money that they spent mm -hmm. that they've been I'd say pretty willing to share with with their contemporaries as far as here we've paid for this information but we'll share it with you and that's pretty helpful because other without somebody paying the people who are doing that research, the research may discontinue. Mm -hmm. And so there is something to be said for a rising tide lifting all ships. And so I do see uh, more money getting put toward the wine industry as a uh, younger and younger group of people start to consume wine as a beverage. Um, a few years ago, I was able to sit down and talk with the guy who started Barefoot and he told me that the reason that they started barefoot was they saw the market was predominantly beer and people in the u.s didn't even want to consider anything named french you know as far as a beverage choice and so he said they needed to do something that was far from nose in the air as possible. So he called it barefoot. <laughs> he wanted to find something that was affordable, that people would start drinking wine. He wanted to shift the demographic of beverage choice. Mm -hmm. And I would say he was largely successful in that endeavor. Um, it's interesting to see that while that change now has definitely taken place, uh, you are going to see 
more investment toward that as people are starting to appreciate wine as a beverage, mm -hmm. not just for uh, cocktail time, but for eating food. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't see as any beer accentuating food items more than a wine. Any food item you give me, I can name three or four wines that are going to accentuate that food item mm -hmm. before a beer will. Mm -hmm. So um, as people's tastes evolve, I think that they're moving toward wine. And as people's wine tastes evolve, I think they move toward Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And, and other cool climate varietal, you know, just because you're not getting smacked over the head. You're actually able to start to taste nuance. So what about for your future? As you look ahead, what, what comes next for you? What are you looking forward to? And uh, what's uh, on the agenda? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> and you know, as far as, as far as knowing what the future holds, nobody knows. Uh, but I, I, wanna, I wanna make uh, wine and I wanna make wine from grapes that I grow. And uh, I really like to make some uh, cool climate Riesling and Muscat. And um, I think that there's a lot of potential for those wines to be not just dry, but also off dry and be very rewarding and very food palatable wines. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that this area is going to lend to that very well in some of the uh, less developed regions that haven't seen a lot of mm -hmm. grapes planted. And I think that's where uh, I think that's where somebody can recognize a great deal of uh, profit margin where you're finding land that has not been previously deemed vineyard land. So the price is going to be possibly uh, better. And I would also like to see vineyards where people actually have to uh, utilize climbing equipment because it's so steep, you know, to farm the to farm the grapes, you know, because I think that can truly produce, um, well, obviously distinct, but very uh, fine and uh, focused Rieslings mm -hmm. is to have super steep, you know, basically unplantable sites. And this is again, I think, going to drive up the profit margin. I probably shouldn't even be saying this out loud. <laughs> Other than I would love to see it happen, and I don't care if somebody beats me to it. Because, mm -hmm. oh man, to see a vineyard where um, you have to have climbers, as on, your vineyard crew has to be repelling to tend the vines, that's, that's a, that would be a dream come true. I would love to see that. If I'm the first one to do it, that'll be, even, that'll be the real dream come true. <clears throat> I think that can combine uh, a couple of interests that coalesce in this industry too. There's so many people who I know in the wine industry who are also interested in climbing. So it's not going to be hard to get people to sign up for that. <laughs> Anything else you're looking ahead to or uh, uh, that's sort of on the horizon for you? Man, um, <clears throat> when we uh, were graduating from high school, they told us that people in our generation would change careers about six times before we would retire. And I had been doing uh, this wine for nearly 20 years, just over 20 years now. And uh, I feel like I'm ready for it to shift a little. I'm, I feel like my focus in wine needs to shift, possibly away from production and into sales and marketing mm -hmm. because um, like I expressed with the cooking, mm -hmm. there is so uh, much accomplishment and reward to turn around and look at, but there's not a lot of thanks in terms of monetary <laughs> financial gain. And I'm, I just turned 41, and I feel like I'm too old to be even worried about finances, like I should have already had that taken care of. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, and I feel like I could have in a different situation. Mm -hmm. And so, I started to make my own situation. All right. That's all the questions that I have yeah. for you today, Mike. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here today that we should have covered? Oh, I'm sure I'll think of that in just about 10 minutes. So many things that I should have told you and so much story there is, you know, and I'm sure I have so many more stories for you, but you know, 
Um, I feel like the uh, potential for this area and for the wines here is innumerable. I feel like the um, improvements that I've seen since I've been dipping my toes in it are just incredible. And I think that uh, I'm just so fortunate to be involved in such a lovely, lovely romantic lifestyle, you know, and it, and it has been. It's been really, really cool. Um, I'd just like to um, tell all the other guys out there, nice work, man. <laughs> Nice work. So, I like it. I yeah. like it. Thank you so much for your time today, for your hospitality, for yeah. sharing your stories with us, and uh, we're going to let you off the hook. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks, Thank man. Thank you.